Hello, and welcome to the Tudors Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. I'm the owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. In the last episode of this series, part two of the life in Tudor England, I covered music, masks, dance, hygiene, clothing, and washing clothes. If you missed out on that one, it's okay because each of these Tudor life episodes can stand alone, so you can really listen to them in any order. As I stated in part one of this series, my passion is really the people of Tudor Court, not necessarily their everyday life. I love all the drama and crazy stories that we can retrieve from old letters and how they give us a glimpse into the personal lives of these amazing people. Understanding their everyday life is very important to understand the entire person, and it's because of that and all of your requests that I have chosen to do this series. Now in this episode, I'm once again talking about a bunch of stuff that I knew nothing about prior to my current research. I did my best to ensure accuracy, but there may be some mistakes. So if you hear any grievous errors, please let me know. You can send me a message on any of my social media platforms or an email to tutorsweekly at gmail.com. For those who are new here, I take a minute at the beginning of every show to thank the people who have been generous enough to donate and become patrons to keep it going. Now, I have two new patrons since the last episode that I need to thank. Sari G and Sue K. Thank you so much and welcome to this gang of awesomeness. Now, that's a total of six new patrons this month alone, so that is so cool. Thank you, guys. I am so flattered when I get a new patron. You have no idea. I would also like to thank Johanna, Doris, Courtney, Anastasia, Anna, Bob, Peggy, Diana, Stacy, Christopher, Rachel H., Rachel D., Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Christine, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa S., Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Heather with the English Renaissance History Podcast, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Melissa C., and Pat B., Before we start this episode, I need to take a minute to talk a bit about the show. If you're new to my podcast and you follow me on iTunes, you are missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can just go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click on posts. I also have a link to them on TudorsDynasty.com in the menu. Now, if you find me on iTunes, I'd also love to see some more five-star ratings and comments there. The more reviews, the higher I will be on the recommendation list for fellow Tudor lovers. Without all of your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts, so I cannot thank you all enough. Now, it's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website. All the money received from the patrons like you go right back into the show. The cost of running the website and research materials, including subscriptions to those hidden or hard to find documents and books. Now, believe it or not, I do have a full time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever decreasing downtime. Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours to complete. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon. Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click on Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. Now, with that, this episode could not have happened without some wonderful books to guide me along the way. A big thanks to Ruth Goodman again and her book, How to Be a Tutor, as well as the Encyclopedia of Tudor England. And lastly, Seamus O'Kelly's book, Pustules, Pain, and Pestilence. This one was a lifesaver for the first topic of this episode. Those three books were instrumental in obtaining proper information to relay to you. I also use quite a few websites to help me out in my learning this time as well. And I will have an article transcript of this episode posted in a few days with all of my sources listed. Okay, so let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to the life of Tudor, England. 
Whether it was a headache, stomach ache, or a fever, there was an herbal remedy for it in Tudor times. As a matter of fact, a mixture of sage, lavender, and marjoram was recommended to treat a headache. If you had more of a stomach ache, then chamomile was the simple cure. And nowadays, ginger is a common remedy for nausea and stomach issues, so it would not surprise me if ginger was also used. Now, when it came to making these remedies, it wasn't just men who made them. Tudor women would also have known how to make herbal remedies, which were known as simples. Author Seamus O'Kelly's book, Postules, Pain, and Pestilence, Tudor Treatments and Ailments of Henry VIII, covers some of the theories in diagnosing one's health. Now, he states that physicians from the 16th century used theories as tools to diagnose a patient's issues. Now, I must be upfront about this. Modern medicine has deemed all of these invalid, <laughs> but there were some that were used up until the 1800s. This included humoral theory, doctrine of signatures, uroscopy, and astrological theory. Now, if you've ever watched the Tudors, then you'll know that it was common practice to bleed someone to balance one's humors. Nowadays, it seems completely ridiculous, but back then, it was common practice. What did they think they were doing exactly? Well, I'm going to try to explain to the best of my ability. First, we have to start with the humors. The four humors are the metabolic agents of the four elements in the human body. The right balance and purity of these humors is essential for maintaining health. When one's humors are out of balance, the patient becomes ill, or so they believed. As O'Kelly states in his book, when a vial of blood is left to sit overnight, it can separate into a black clot at the bottom, a red layer of blood cells, a white layer containing white blood cells, and yellow serum at the top. The four humors and elements they serve are as follows. All four of these humors or vital fluids are present in the bloodstream in varying quantities. Blood, also known as sanguine humor, is the red hemoglobin-rich portion. Phlegm, also known as phlegmatic humor, is present as the clear plasma portion. Yellow bile, also known as choleric humor, is present as a slight residue or bilirubin, imparting a slight yellowish tint. And black bile, also known as melancholic humor, is present as a brownish gray sediment with platelets and clotting factors. Now a doctor would attempt to help their patient bring back balance to their four humors, either through herbal treatments, changes to the environment, and bloodletting. The doctrine of signatures is another interesting concept. This goes back to the belief that God made certain plants to be used to help us heal. It was believed that if a plant looked like a body part, that it should be used to help aid in treatment of what ills the patient. For example, eye bright was used for eye issues. Now, I'll be honest, I just looked up a picture of eye bright flower to see if it resembled the human eye and I did not see it at all. So I can make fun of these methods all I want, but in the time of the tutors, this seemed legit. Euroscopy. Now I've heard of this many times from watching period pieces. Now this is where the doctor would examine one's urine by smell, taste, and even sight. They believed that if a person's urine was cloudy and milk-like, that it could indicate a urinary tract infection. If urine tasted sweet, it indicated diabetes. If the patient's urine had a brownish tint, then the patient would most likely have jaundice. If the urine was red and or foamy, the patient was suffering from kidney disease. And if urine had blood in it, then the patient was suffering from tumors in the urinary tract. So fascinating. Lastly, the fourth way to diagnose an ailment was by medical astrology. Now, if you're like me when I first read it, you're probably saying, what? Nowadays, someone might ask you in light conversation what your sign is. Now, I'm a Libra, which in Tudor times was connected to one's kidneys and, well, rear end. It was required by law in the 1500s for a physician to look at a star chart and calculate the location of stars before moving forward with any procedure like bleeding someone. In 1514, King Henry VIII is believed to have contracted smallpox, just as his daughter Elizabeth had in 1563. But it appears that Henry was spared from any scarring. Anyway, one of the absurd treatments or cures for the disease was thought to be hanging red curtains around the patient's bed. If only it were that easy. 
Instead, the patient was more than likely treated for each of their symptoms. One treatment for fever, one for a sleep aid, one for treating the pustules, and one for treating the scabs. Now, if you're interested in learning more specifically about that and what's used in these instances, I'd recommend buying Pustules Pain and Pestilence by Seamus O'Kelly. Now, let's step back a minute. Tudor medicine was practiced by three different types of specialists, physicians, surgeons, and apothecaries, not to mention a variety of healers, midwives, and of course, outright quacks. The physician was the most respected of the bunch, and they rarely saw their patients. Instead, they would diagnose an illness through uroscopy or testing one's urine. The surgeon was below a physician in status. A surgeon had very little formal education and learned best by performing operations at the direction of physicians. The apothecaries also had a lower social status than the physicians, but the apothecaries were the ones who essentially filled the physician's prescriptions. As usual, women were not allowed to practice medicine, but women did have some basic training and they could serve as healers and midwives. Now, if you're a fan of watching Outlander like I am, you would already know this because Claire was often looked at as a witch for practicing, all because she was a woman. Gotta love that show. I can't wait for next season. Now, the next part in this episode, we're going to talk about the hierarchy or the peerage and understand it a little bit better. Since I spoke of the hierarchy of those involved with medicine, I thought that it was also a perfect time to speak about titles in Tudor England. So before I get started, I'm sure that you can tell that I'm American. So learning all these different titles and names has not come easy for me as it would for someone who grew up with this history. The only titles that we have here are ones involved in government like president, vice president, senator, and the list goes on. And then we have the old Mr., Mrs., Miss, Ms., all of that, which I think personally are unnecessary. I've taken some guidance again from Ruth Goodman's book, How to Be a Tutor, as well as the Encyclopedia of Tutor England. In the blog post that will follow this podcast, I'll be sure to source it for your reference. So how did the hierarchy work exactly? Aristocracy was at the top of the list. Aristocrats owned several large estates and maintained households which sometimes had up to 150 people in them. Plus, being that they had multiple houses, they would on occasion move between them. This would allow the servants time to clean the house while they were at another location. There were five titles of nobility, Duke, Marquis, Earl, Viscount, and Baron. Now, those titles were obtained through inheritance or royal creation. As an example, Thomas Seymour did not inherit the title Baron Seymour of Sudley, but he was created it by his nephew, King Edward VI. I've also been interested in forms of address in Tudor England. Master was a respectful term used and would be compared to the modern day Mr. It was commonly used for gentlemen, professional men, and substantial citizens. For example, Master Owen Jones, or Master Jones, or Master Owen. Now, your honor or your worship was an all-purpose address for men of higher status than you. Your honor was commonly used for justices of the peace, while your worship would have been used for a magistrate or a member of the clergy. Being addressed as Sir was a common address for those holding the title of Knight. If someone called Sir Francis Bryan, one can assume that he at least holds the title of knight. The form of address used for any noble was my lord or my lady. Now, not everyone could use this. Catherine Howard was the daughter of Edmund Howard. He was the brother to the third Duke of Norfolk. Now, he did not hold any titles himself, and so his daughter was not called Lady Catherine Howard. Anne Boleyn did not become Lady Anne until her father was raised in status to Viscount Rochford. Then she was often referred to as Lady Rochford. Your Grace was only appropriate for those with the rank of Duke or higher. As an example, Your Grace, the Duke of Suffolk. Your Highness was the correct address for a member of the royal family like the King, the Queen, and maybe his children as well. Your Majesty was reserved for use with the monarch only, as example, Your Majesty King Henry. Then we have My Liege, which, to be honest, appears to have been obsolete during the Tudor era, but in centuries before, may have been used for the monarch before Your Majesty became popular. 
An interesting tidbit, around 1519, King Henry VIII decided majesty should become the style of the sovereign of England. Majesty, however, was not used exclusively. It arbitrarily alternated with both highness and grace, even in official documents. Now, your excellency was more appropriate for, say, a bishop. So let's say you were approaching Bishop John Fisher. You would call him your excellency. Now, something to keep in mind, these English peers did not transfer their noble status to all of their children, just like Edmund Howard. Now, only the eldest sons were the lucky ones, and they were the ones who would inherit their father's land and titles. Unfortunately, the younger siblings, just as with all members of the gentry, they were non-titled landholders and they were considered commoners. So let's talk about the gentry. The gentry had land holdings, but were generally smaller and more concentrated to a geographic area. Now, officially, a gentleman was a man who had the right to a coat of arms. They did not engage in productive labor, and they often owned and rented out land for others to work. Those who were called gentlemen generally had homes of six or more rooms and had several servants whose focus was personal domestic service. Then after them, we go to the yeomen. Now, there are a lot of these guys, so the yeomen would often rent land from those above them in status, like the gentry and the aristocracy, but it is possible that they owned portions as well. They, unlike those above them, would farm the land themselves. The yeomen were, on occasion, richer than gentlemen, and then the difference was that they were actively involved on the land. After the yeomen come husbandmen. Now, I've always thought this name was odd. A husband is someone you're married to. A husbandman is someone who farms their rented land. And this would be small-scale land. Their homes, unlike their betters, were generally only two rooms, and most of the labor came from within the family. So I grew up on a dairy farm. Now my dad rented land from his mother, and my siblings and I, along with some relatives on occasion, helped him farm the land. So I guess my dad was a husbandman. At the bottom of the totem pole were laborers. These men, primarily men, I'd say, held no land at all, but had to hire themselves out to their social neighbors for a daily wage. They generally lived in single-room homes and unfortunately had a diet rich in bread. So that will do it. Wrapping up the last part in the series on life in Tudor England. This has been a fun journey to go on with you, but to be honest, I'm excited to get back to something else. Something maybe I know a little bit more about, and it definitely makes the whole process much easier and more fun for me. But with that being said, I'm always taking your feedback for topic ideas for the show, so please keep them coming in. If you do have an idea for a show topic, please send me a message on social media or an email to tutorsweekly at gmail.com. So with that, thank you so much for joining me again this week for an episode of Tutor's Dynasty Podcast. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, same name, Tutor's Dynasty, and check out my website, tutorsdynasty.com. Until next time.